It says she snapped. For joining us. I'll let you. Are you ready, Shannon? I am ready. Well, good afternoon, everyone. As Shannon said, I'm Barbara Remondini. Before I share my screen, I'm going to try to get my um, presentation set up. So if you'll just bear with me for just a second. I think I have everything ready, but um, Zoom doesn't always go the way we plan it. We learned that today for sure. D did you? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the problem with this is I actually have to share my screen and then try to um, launch the um, presentation. So let me see if I can do this in the right order because I have done this before, I promise. Okay, I think you should be able to sh see my screen now. Is that correct? Yes, we can. Great. Well, good, after, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be a part of this um, conference. I am so sorry that we are not in person. I'm sure everybody else would rather be in um, cool Flagstaff, Arizona, rather than sitting in their office. But it is nice that we have this virtual opportunity to meet and perhaps share some information and learn from each other. And hopefully today's session will be valuable to you. Before I begin, I want to just um, just do my usual spiel when I do conferences. I've I've done a lot of um, presentations literally around the world and I always say our professional learning opportunities in this profession are so limited and I, and I recognize that sometimes it's a big um, commitment to give up some time, even an hour to learn. So um, please provide feedback if this presentation is not valuable to you and you find it halfway through and you click off, you are not offending me if you wanna join the other session that's in pro progress because I know that can be kind of stressful, but I do look forward to any feedback that you might um, have. Um, Shannon, are, can you verify how many people are in the room with us? I was 29 so far. Great, great. Well, well welcome all 29 of you. Um, I'll, I'll probably mix this up just a little bit. I believe all of you should be muted, but um, um, I always like to have an interactive session. So that's a little bit more challenging when we're not face to face, but we're still going to attempt to do that. Um, so like Shannon said, my name is Barbara Remondini. I am the Director of Human Resources in the Kyrene Elementary School District. And I'm actually currently working in my office at Rickenburg Unified School District where I'm transitioning to the superintendency. So um, I, I'm looking forward to that role and that change. But um, my presentation is primarily regarding things that have to do with the human resources realm as I've lived in that world for quite a, quite a while. My goals for this afternoon are just to kind of go over some hiring practices um, employee attendance issues and um, a little bit on employee conduct. And I put in the lessons learned because I'd really, really like to have an opportunity for folks to have a, um, a, be able to converse with each other and, and ask questions and talk about that. So I've built it in. So if you are um, muted and you would like to say something, there will be an opportunity there. Shannon, I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to help me navigate the muting and the unmuting. So um, I'm hoping this goes well. So thanks for your patience and your cooperation. Before we begin, I just wanna remind everyone that policy and procedures vary from district to district and this, this session is presented as guidance. Please follow all instructions and advice of your employer. I don't want any phone calls from directors of HR, superintendents saying, well, Barbara said, um, because Barbara does say, and Barbara has some guidance and some um, best practices, but please refer to your own um, district policies and procedures. And with that, let's start with some legal hiring practices. I firmly believe that if you begin and hire right, it saves you so much time, effort, and energy. And a lot of you, I think, on this call are in the position of being supervisors and responsible or at least take part in the hiring process. And I appreciate that. And um, I realize that any one of us, and me included, if you've hired There we go. I 
I think I'm back, right? What I was saying is that if you've hired any length of time, hired anybody, you've probably hired badly at some point, or you will, and we've all kind of paid the price for that. So hopefully some of the tips and tricks I'm going to share with you and some of the lessons learned will help prevent that or minimize when that does happen, how you can kind of fix it or what you need to do. Just a reminder that um, we live in the United States and we have federal state um, laws that guide our um, legality, the legal issues of, around um, employment and hiring. That's hard to do, especially when we live in small towns, small communities, and we know somebody who knows somebody, but please be sure that you are protecting the district and your best interests from any legal implications or failure to hire um, based on any of these rules and regulations. Um, primarily, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of them, some of the ones that are most easy to get yourself into trouble ones are the most, most common. The um, claims against discrimination based on race, color, national origin, sex, and religion. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of how that can actually happen, as well as age discrimination and um, the Americans with Disability Act. So you don't have to have those acts memorized, but you do have to keep those in the back of your head because in um, failure to hire and um, um, unlawful dismissal can come into play if we don't follow those policies and the, the procedures. Hiring is the most important task that you have as a leader. It, it is very, very costly to hire badly. You may not know these statistics, but it can cost as much as 40% of a person's annual salary when you hire poorly and have to go into any process to either discipline, suspend, or dismiss an employee. It's very, very costly. That doesn't even take into consideration the cost for hiring, posting positions, recruiting, the time it takes to interview and make those decisions. So please take your time and um, make sure that you put your full effort into doing it right the first time. It's also, as I mentioned before, legal exposure for the district. So let's start with screening. One of the first things I tell directors and leaders, especially as they're first beginning to hire, and I recognize in the transportation world in Arizona and around the, the nation, and I should mention that my sister is actually a bus driver in New Mexico, and, and I've worked with schools and districts all over the United States, and it's not like there's a line of people anywhere just dying to drive school buses. And I know you have other positions in the transportation industry, but Unfortunately, these are, um, these are positions where there's a lot of competition for the very few people who are available. But um, the first thing you need to know is know your job description. And um, please work with your HR department. If your job description is outdated or hasn't been updated in a while, please make sure that you as the expert in the transportation field know what that job description should say and what, should, what it should look like. And then verify the posting aligns with the job description. Most schools of any size do some type of electronic or vir virtual posting of jobs and attach job descriptions to it later. Mistakes happen, sometimes wrong job description is attached to a posting. So double check that, take that upon yourself, to make sure that you've um, corrected those so that as you are um, screening and looking at applicants that you've kind of taken care of those two things off the top of your, before you begin looking at applicants. As you're looking at your job, job description and your posting, make sure that you identify your skills, your knowledge, the expertise, the certifications, and the training that, that, you, that you desire in your applicants. What are you looking for? It's rare that you will have, um, in any position, that you will have multiple applicants that meet every single criteria that you're asking for. Um, I know we do a lot of our own training in, in any field of education, but specifically in transportation. You may not hire somebody who has a CDL already or has a, a fingerprint clearance or whatever certifications you require, but just know what you're looking for. And I suggest that you create a rubric that prioritizes each of those ideal characteristics of the applicant so that you know what you're looking for before you begin to look at applicant, applicants. And I'm operating under the assumption that you're going to have loads and loads of applications and that you're not just looking for one or two or that you have only one opening and you have 10 applications. That would be a good problem to have. But um, that means that you really need to put some effort into just figuring out what is important to you. 
and then use that rubric to select your top choices to interview. When you're interviewing, and this is really the key to it, never interview alone. Um, not only does it set yourself, set you up for um, a failure to hire um, claim, you didn't hire somebody based on something, it protects you and the district from any type of discrimination claim, but it also is best practice because it's nice when two people or can hear the same thing. We all have our different points of view. Somebody can take notes, somebody can um, listen carefully. But when you include somebody else in the interview, and a colleague, another, another bus driver, another person in a, another mechanic in, the, in a light job, ensure that everybody involved is aware of the legal interviewing practices. And this is where I was going to just kind of give you some hints and tips. Um, it happens a lot. This is the interview is sometimes where we violate those um, best practices for interviewing and those legal implications. And I can, we're going to give an opportunity to share some tidbits, but I was in a conversation one time, invited somebody in to do an interview, and it actually happened to be for a security monitor at a school site. And one of the people sitting in on the interview committee said, um, didn't we go to high school together? You look familiar. Well, the person didn't give the job and then made a claim for age discrimination, saying that the person that was interviewing was trying to figure out how old the applicant was. So it's little things like that that kind of get us into trouble. So we need to make sure that everybody who's involved in the interviewing process is aware of those little nuances and those little things that they could say that could expose the district to any type of risk. As you're preparing for the interview, make sure you establish the criteria and a scoring rubric before the interview. Please think ahead. What do you want to hear? When you write a set of questions, answer them. Make sure you are very clear on what you are hoping your best candidate says. That way, when you hear it, you know you've heard it. And when you don't hear it, you, you, you know you haven't heard it. And make sure that any committee members that are interviewing with you understand what you expect to hear why you expect to hear it, and they have an opportunity to thoroughly understand the questions you're asking. And don't assume that because they're in the same field that you are, that they will have the same understanding of the types of questions you're asking. Um, make sure everybody on the committee understands the decision-making process. What does the scoring rubric look like? How many points are we given for this? Especially if you have any type of writing project or on-the-job um, demonstration that you might have applicants um, go through and participate in. Make sure that you and they all understand that same thing. I'm rushing through this because typically I do a whole session on interviewing and hiring and it takes an hour to do just that part. So I'm trying to get through this. So if you have other questions or need other um, information about this, I actually do have a wealth of, of um, um, content around just interviewing and hiring and setting up um, people for success. So, and that's the next part. When we're interviewing, I believe very, very strongly that we want every applicant that we interview to shine like a polished diamond during the interview. We want everyone to do their best. There should be no surprises. We should not be putting people in situations that they're caught off guard, that they are um, uncomfortable. That doesn't mean you can't ask them to think on their feet with some very specific types of questions so that you can figure out what their response time is and their decision making, but you wanna set them up for success. The worst thing to do is to interview people who are nervous who are not able to respond, who fumble through the interview, because then you don't know whether they're a good candidate or not. So I suggest that they are provided with a job description and a copy of the questions. A lot of people balk at that. They should have already looked at the job description, but most people show up to an interview early. And if somebody is greeting them and they are handed the job description and the questions they can, they're going to be asked, 
that will give them a time to relax, take a deep breath, make sure they understand what they're going through, and they don't have time to, and maybe they do get on their phones and Google some answers to questions, but that's not the worst case is to set somebody up for success. Um, so, and there are people who have differing feelings about that, but I believe that we need to set people up for success. There's, there's um, a, lot to, a lot of good that comes from when people are relaxed and able to have a conversation. Make sure you use the applicant's name, make sure you make them feel comfortable and they, they know that you know you're there. Be enthusiastic. I know I don't have to talk to many of you about that. This is a very exciting um, field that we're in and certainly transporting students is very important and um, our transportation workers are generally enthusiastic and want to be around students and um, just making sure that you would remember that is what you're there for. And then describe the process to be used for the interview and the selection process. Make sure the candidate knows what's gonna happen during the interview. Some people choose to time interviews, some people choose to time individual questions, some people choose to do some type of task or um, activity prior to the questions and some do it op opposite. But it's only fair that they know what they're getting themselves into and then candidates will always ask you, when will I know if I'm selected for the position? So be prepared to ask, answer those questions and be prepared to answer the questions about what other requirements do they need to meet before they're considered with, um, for the position. And we're gonna talk about that, but one of them is fingerprint clearance card. Do they have to have a fingerprint clearance card before they can move forward or did you require that prior to the interview? So be prepared and know those answers before you begin. Um, let's avoid discrimination. Do ask all candidates if they can perform essential duties of the job. If you, if you word that question in that way, you ensure that you are not discrimination, discriminating against anybody based on any perceived or um, visual disability. If they, if they have the job description and they verify they can perform the essential duties, then you should be fine with moving on with the interview. If somebody has a visible disability that you think might prevent them from doing their job that they've applied for, don't make any assumptions on that part. Ask this question and then it will be up to them to provide any additional information you might need in order to consider them for the position. Um, please use a structured interview process and try to, whenever possible, interview multiple candidates if they're available. It, it, interview as many as, not as many as you can because you're gonna get loads and loads of applicants to drive buses and you're not gonna have a shortage anymore. Don't ask any questions related to age, race, color, sex, religion, all of those things. Um, and, and now the protected class is um, sexual identity and sexual orientation. So make sure that you do not in any way imply that their ability to do their job is related to any of those factors. And the biggest don't is don't wing it. Do not just say, oh, come in and chat with me and we'll decide that. Yes, a lot of good information is found um, when we are just having conversations with people. We can learn a lot about what they know, what they're able to do whether they're going to get along with the team, whether they're going to fit in, all of those things. But winging it sets you and the district up for legal action for failure to hire or discrimination in your hiring practices. So if you have a structured interview process, you have a formal rubric, you ask everybody the same questions and give roughly the same amount of time, you will be um, avoiding discrimination and avoid, avoiding any legal action in the hiring process. Um, it is required under Arizona Revised Statute 15 is the education section and 15-512 requires that we make a good faith effort to do reference and background checks for all employment before employees. And reference and background checks are different. So, the first thing is to make sure that you verify during the application process that the applicant you're considering to interview and interviewed has given you permission to conduct a background and a reference check. Most applications are um, already have that in there. And so you must um, 
be sure that you don't contact somebody without their permission. Um, so make sure that's there first. And if you have any questions about that, contact HR. Um, and let me, let me just talk a little bit about the difference between a reference check and a background check. Background checks are primarily done by human resources in some type of formal process, whether there is um, a run on somebody's fingerprint clearance, whether there's um, use a third party vendor to do a legal background check, or whether you do an informal. Reference checks are just that. You are verifying employment of the person and you're getting a verbal or a written reference before you hire somebody. The, rep, the background check is usually pertaining to legal issues, verification of employment, and anything that might prevent somebody from being eligible to be hired in the state or in the country. A reference check, as you well know, is where you get the good information about whether they should be considered to be hired in your, in, in your school, in your department. A lot of um, districts use electronic reference checks where you can just send out a form. I, I think the forms are fine, but I also believe that it is your responsibility as the hiring administrator to make sure that somebody has a physical, verbal conversation with somebody else that that person has worked for in the past. I strongly suggest you have a neutral party somebody who did not participate in the interview process to be the person to pick up the phone and conduct the reference checks. Perhaps an administrative assistant, perhaps a colleague, even if they're using the same form that the electronic reference check is used, there's a lot that can be said during that conversation. I recommend a neutral third party person because you've already possibly interviewed that person and you may already have a preconceived idea about what you want to hear. And again, I have lots of content on this and some example conversations to have when you're conducting reference checks. It's best to go to employers at least five years back, but most recent employer is the most important. Um, it, and I do recommend you contact the current employer via phone. Now, I will tell you, and we run into it more and more in the transportation business, there are a lot of entities where you may be rec recruiting people to work in your departments that are not easy to get reference checks on. You can only get employment verifications. Tyrene is finding more and more um, larger cities, um, and municipalities that are using a third party vendor to just, and all they will do is verify employment. And that's unfortunate because we can never talk to the employer, um, but, but sometimes that is the case. I do recommend that if you're not able to contact somebody through, an, a, you know, through the process of reference check, that when you get to your top candidate, that you let them know you would like to have a conversation with their former employer and see what their relationship is with their former supervisor to provide that last check of reference checks, making sure that you're following the district background reference check um, process. So I'm gonna stop and take a deep breath and we have a few minutes if there's anybody out there that has what I would call lessons learned. Have you any, any story? Sometimes it's fun to share, share stories. Oh, I did this wrong one time, so please don't make that. But we don't wanna use any names or any specifics or even districts or if there are any questions or clarification that anybody needs from this session while I take a drink of water. And Shannon, if you can monitor that, if there's anybody who wants to um, unmute themselves or. I can, um, so we have a question um, and I think Bill, you mean if they say no, what do you do? Are you talking about the most recent supervisor or the, um, the candidate? If you wanna unmute yourself. The candidate. Okay, so if the can if if we say to them, look, you're in our top group, and they say no, I don't have a phone number or what have you. What what's your response? So that's actually an interesting question that I usually don't take out of this session, but I was hoping I'd bypass it here because that 
and I know um, Shannon and Jason have both been through my training at least once. And I always say that, what happens if the candidate says, don't call my previous supervisor? And I, and I would say it depends. I, I think that at some point we say to these to, to people that we're looking to hire, I have to have a reference. I have to be able to speak to somebody. Sometimes that just making that statement elicits more information. Sometimes people leave on bad terms and they don't want you to know it. They think it's gonna be used against you. Sometimes people have been asked to leave and they don't want you to know that. I would not say in either of those situations that that is not a good person for you to hire. There are a lot of other factors in place. And, and I, I, I say this all the time, everybody has a place in this world and everybody has a position. They just may not have been in the right place at the right time. But following your district and your um, policies and procedures, we do require that we speak to the most recent supervisor before we can move forward with hiring. And we just let them know that. If we can't get a hold of a recent supervisor, they're no longer a candidate. Um, and that, that sometimes that pushes them to kind of get that recent supervisor to explain to us what happened. Um, certainly if the employer, the employer let the employee go due to any illegal activity or anything that would uh, make the person ineligible for hire, then we would want to know that and they wouldn't be a candidate for us anyway. But sometimes they're just not a good fit or, or whatever. And, and sometimes that happens. So. And in my, in my district, um, if on the application where it's marked, may we contact previous employer? If it's marked, no, we, they're not even eligible for an interview. Oh, um, that's interesting. Just, Some, just yeah. Decide right away. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I do know that in some cases, people park, mark no without a comment. And we allow the supervisor or the hiring administrator to contact them and find out why. And oftentimes, it's a timing issue. They don't want us to contact their current supervisor until they let the supervisor know they are being considered for another position because they don't want to run the risk of retaliation or losing it, which is, by the way, is very illegal to do. If you terminate somebody because they're looking for another job, you're doing something wrong. The employee is not. So, um, but we can, we can make sure that that is, um, that, that, that you can ask the, you can, you can contact, unless your district says you may not contact them all. I do encourage, I encourage our um, hiring administrators to reach out and find out why can I not um, ha, um, contact this person. And then some an additional comment is just it's really hard to contact um, yeah. references. Like that's the hardest part I think for some of us is just that repeat effort to and not connecting with others. Yeah and in Kyrene we allow and we encourage especially in these hard to fill positions which I, I imagine most of you are, who are on this call are sitting in hard to fill positions and looking for hard to fill positions um, and, and I do recommend even during that screening process if the candidate has indicated that we can contact their employees start sending out those electronic reference checks right away. Off, when I get one of those from a friend or a former colleague, I contact them and say, hey, I just got a reference check from XYZ district. What can I do to help you? And so that getting a jump on it helps you. And, and they don't always reply, especially again, if we're hiring them from muni other municipalities, but you, you certainly um, are not prohibited from doing that. You just need to make sure that you have their permission to seek out that. We've run an issue lately with two different applicants that we go through the process, we do the reference checks, everything comes out great. We submit to HR and then they do their next part, but we've already offered position and they've started and we found out that they've lied on their application. Yeah. And then it becomes, it's an, they just let them go immediately. You know, it's yep. out of our hands, but we've discussed, do we not even offer until HR has finished their process to tell us? And that could take, I mean, HR is not, you know, they don't sit around all day doing nothing. They're very busy people <laughs> when they are hiring for a district with like 9,000 employees. We get that. Right. So that, that's been one of the issues we've worked on also. Yeah. And I agree with that. Um, is it Th Thomas, where do you work? Big district? Uh, I'm at Litchfield Elementary. Okay. So yeah. And, and, and you, again, you're competing with a small sector of employees and, and I, and I think that for some employees, we say do not hire HR. I will put my HR hat on and keep it on for a little while. I say do not hire until HR has finished their process. But I also know that, that at some point we have to trust people. And we do have a clause in every um, working agreement, every, every hiring process. And 
I recommend hiring administrators um, when they're offering the position prior to all of that being finished based on a a complete and thorough background check and verification of all the information you have applied to us, we are recommending you for this position. Should we find out that any of this information is not in line or does not match up with our district expectations, we will move to terminate you and say that during that process. But you want to get ahead of people. It's tough because in our industry, I mean, it's it's four to six weeks from the time we get them in the door until, you know, they're certified yeah. to drive. And I mean, I know... I'm one of those administrators that just gets so irritated with how long an HR process takes. It's like two weeks and it's like, okay, now I'm six to eight weeks out and school starts in four and a half weeks, you know? So yeah. I get it. it. It's just, it's sometimes it's so frustrating, but it's not yeah, a and personally a tr promise. I promise. <laughs> and it, it is tough. And I do think, you know, I, and I think you maybe the, you, those of you who are on this call recognize that, Shannon and I are somewhat friends as well. She, she and I worked at a prior district and now are working again in Kyrene and have kind of known each other um, both in that world. And I, I do think it is very important that that um, relationship with HR, I do, I do trust that our human resource team, when I go to human resource conferences, we talk about how hard it is to find transportation employees. <laughs> so just developing that, if there's anything that can happen, any little tidbits that can be put in place to, to minimize that time and um, well, work it, around. It's difficult in transportation because we're an entire separate entity from everything in the district. Not only are we having to follow district HR practices, but we're DOT, we're DPS, yep. we're FMCSA. Yep. So if the district standard and procedure policy says this, okay, but DPS says, I can't do that. I have to do this. It's, it's playing that balancing game with yep. HR and all of our other regulations. And I know we've all had that battle at some point with, you can't do that. DPS can't tell you. Um, they can't run our department. Well, they kind of do. They kind of you know, do. So right? We yeah. have to be like, okay, you can think they don't, but they'll pull all of us off the road and then audit us and then we're screwed. Yeah. And sometimes I'm happy that DOT takes that. You know, like, I'm not happy to let that throw that into there. Yeah, them. let them put it on their hat, not let you. Them do it. He just says they can't. Sorry, nothing I can do. Easy. <laughs> yeah, Thank but, you, you know, Dr. Remandini. This is awesome. Thank you. Tommy, uh, by, the, by the same token, you know, ADE can pull somebody out of a classroom and, and HR doesn't have any control over it either. Sure. Well, I, I wish that happened more often than it does, to be quite <laughs> honest with you. They're a little bit further behind than Department of Transportation is, just saying, just, just so you know. Yeah, right. we, had, we had the issue a couple of years ago where, where the PPT test, physical performance test, you know, opening and uh -huh. closing the door, Jerry goes, well, I can't do that because it bothers my shoulder. And we're like, okay, then you're not certified anymore. You're not yeah. certified. You're not employee. And our HR goes, well, you can't just terminate because they have an issue with their shoulder. We got to find recommendation. No, DPS says they have to open and close the they door. Have to be able to open them, yeah. yeah. Or they're not meeting the job description. Now, the district could offer some other type of employment or other type of position, if, especially if it's a short term. There might be leave, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about. There might be an answer there, but the answer is not keep them in a position that they no longer qualify for. So right. I'm right. not arguing with any of your HR yeah. directors. I know I most of them, and I want to keep my relationship. <laughs> with them, so. Actually, okay. my, my HR department is more supportive of that type of thing, Tommy. Yeah. I think we're caught up on questions. Okay, we're gonna move forward with these, These the next sec section is actually my favorite section, but the one that I will actually have the fewest hard concrete answers to, because when we start talking about employee issues and employee relations issues, my favorite saying is, it depends. But let's talk first about employee attendance, because I do believe that we have a certain sector of um, employees in any district. And trust me, folks, I've worked with districts literally around the world and schools around the world. And I'm not saying this lightly. You are in a world where this is, you're among friends out there. Um, you employ a, a group um, that, it, that it's tough to find, it's tough to, tough to keep, and sometimes um, can, can cause us some, some of our issues. But employee attendance seems to be one that's pretty recent and I don't blame it all on the millennials. I do blame it a little bit on um, who's willing to do some of the jobs, the profession itself. We, we have a hard time in education just attracting and retaining people because we think 
well, I won't get on my political stance about education needing more money, but um, well, let's talk just a little bit about attendance. And it is very important that you know your own district specific policies. I assume that most of us are Arizona School Boards Association policy providers, but I do recognize there are um, some districts in the state that operate on their own policies with their own policy advisors through um, a legal process outside of ASBA. But most of us use ASBA, so I pulled those policies up and not the, the specific policies. But please make sure as a leader in the area that you understand what those policies say and how those specific policies are tweaked or formatted for your district. Even though ASBA has provided some guidelines and some templates, I do find that most districts finagle, particularly GCCA, which deals with the accrual and the use of sick leave or ACA time. So don't assume that that one's the same in all districts, especially if you've been some, someplace else. But please know those policies. If you work in a district that has any working agreements, if you have any of the um, employee groups that work on working conditions, any type of meet and confer, please make sure you look at those agreements as well and district specific. It's also very important for you to know kind of the, the, the protocol, the history, how do we do things here? Because I promise you it's different in every district and what it is. You know <laughs> that what says in one district is not necessarily in another district. So proceed with a caution. And, and I always, you know, attendance issues are, are hard to deal with, especially as we, as we look at the human factor in that. But we do have chronic lateness, people not showing up on time. We have excessive absences and we have um, some cases of employees refusing to work, just refusing to do, especially, and I, I, I love to use bus drivers as a situation because some of you probably have split schedules. They run a morning run and a late run. Well, what do they do in between? And they, some, you might have some say, I'm not gonna, I'll do the morning, but I'm not gonna do the late, or I won't do a kindergarten run in the middle of the day, whatever that is. Um, but as you're dealing with attendance issues, these are my, this is my recommended solution, and it's hard. And I know some of you just wanna go straight to other issues, but um, the first step is speaking to the employee to gain an understanding of the why, whether it's chronic lateness, excessive absences, refusing to work. Make sure that the employee understands the policy, their job descriptions, and your expectations. I had a, an employee, wasn't a transportation employee one time, but he wanted to work in the middle of the night. And he, was, he had a job that he probably could work in the middle of the night because he didn't have direct contact with students on a daily basis, although when he had contact with students, he was expected to be. And I said to him, no, my expectations are you are here during school day. And he couldn't believe that I could enforce that. But yes, the supervisor has expectations. You have your job description, you have your job expectations. So if you expect them to be on time, by golly, they need to be on time. Document all conversations, beginning with that first conversation to gain an understanding of the why. It is our hope that at that lowest level of conversation, we solve the problem, we solve the issue, but if not, and you've recorded that conversation for your own notes, you've started that documentation process. Even if you have a verbal, verbal conversation, I recommend you follow up in writing. Based on our conversation today, an email, this is what I heard you say, and this is what I have said to you. You've documented, it serves as directives. Um, and consider short-term solutions. There might be a reason somebody's late for a short period of time. Somebody in their household has a new job, whatever. Consider some short-term solutions, especially if in all other ways, the employee is a valuable employee, you have a shortage, you wanna work with the person. Sometimes those things work to solve those issues. I'm being distracted by the chat coming up, so I'm gonna get to the chat, and make sure that we can talk about that. Um, but make sure that um, HR is involved. And sometimes people who have, who have excessive absences actually might qualify for a leave of absence. And you might wanna go that route rather than a discipline route and try to correct the issue. I'm not telling you you have to do that. I'm just saying treat the people with humanity and you're more likely to keep them around. So um, I'm gonna go on to the next slide and then I'm gonna add a stop in before 
I thought I was. I'm looking at the clock up there. Um, if, if an employee fails to re approve, improve in any of those areas, the six things that are listed here are six of the 16 reasons that are stated in policy GDQD, which is discipline, suspension, and dismissal of support staff memory, members. Six of the 16 are, can be related to absenteeism or chronic lateness or any of those. So you are well within your rights to move to policy GDQD to consider discipline, suspension, and dismissal. That's our next section but it's our hope that you can find a solution to get the person to improve before you get there. And then I was going to not stop and go straight into employee conduct, but based on the chat, I might just kind of pause here um, and just see, whoops, see if there's anything that we need to chat about or if so, I'm clicking on the wrong um, slide. Yeah, I can share them with you if you'd like. Okay. Um, let's see, where are we? Sorry, guys, got a little bit too far. Um, yeah, Karma, HR's first question. Did you document that conversation? <laughs> Absolutely. Right. right. Um, so Patrick says, now with heightened awareness of sending staff home with um, sore throats or symptoms, it will get worse, attendance. Yep. Um, I think knowing the the state guidance as it relates to the symptoms and what we're going to do will be a big deal. I agree. And I'll add just a piece here because, you know, if we're sharing stories a little bit that, you know, Shannon, Shannon uses this comment, uh, don't mistake kindness for weakness. And I think that <laughs> some of us fall Thanks. into the um, category of being kind and trying to be maybe a little bit more understanding of a person's situation and then it turns into being taken advantage of and so from when you're looking at it from that standpoint at what point does it turn to be um, taken advantage of right and so that documentation piece especially for myself as I'm still young in my career especially as a supervisor uh, or an administrator is trying to figure out how to you know we get we we're all guilty of getting so busy that we forget to document those things even if it's just a sentence or two or having a place that we go to quickly and not letting it go hey, yeah i'll get to it tomorrow morning and then tomorrow morning turns into you know a total cluster and you're already a week out and it's like man i don't remember what that, that conversation was that i i kind of know it but i'm i'm kind of paraphrasing it at the same time so um, those are those pieces that even I'm struggling with and trying to, you know, to try and figure out how my system will work. But those are just some things that, you know, again, we all want to understand and treat people as humans, but we also want to make sure that we're holding them accountable because we have a commitment to our community and our staff and our students to make sure that they're getting where they need to go in a timely manner. Right. Yep, for sure. Yeah. I appreciate that. And that's why I really highly recommend you follow up every conversation with a quick email. Thanks for your time today. This is what I heard you say. And this is what I said. These are our expectations and reiterate something. And email is a great legal document if you need it. And it is a documentation of the process. Do you expect a reply from them afterwards? They, they don't have to reply, but I will tell you this more often than not, um, I've had multiple opportunities for somebody to um, accuse, and that's a negative word, and I don't mean that as negative as it sounds, but to state that nobody followed up with them after a meeting, and I can pull up a two-sentence email and say, this is some pretty good follow-up right here. You see what I mean? So it covers you in a lot of cases. So okay. it's worth the time it takes just to follow up, and you have it in writing, and, and then you've also avoided that. Well, they never followed up with me. So yeah, I wish attendance was easier. I do think that most people have a reason for not following our attendance policies. I think that the reason may be that they're in the wrong job at the wrong time. It's not always that they're in the wrong job. They may be in the wrong job at the wrong time. And both of those have to line up for them to, to be a good employee and to have good, um, a good work ethic and, um, and, and, and good attendance. So 
trying to help them get there will certainly help all of you. And it sends a message to the rest of your team exactly. that you have expectations and that you're going to hold everyone to the same expectations so that others aren't overburdened. I don't know how many of you are fully staffed in your transportation department and probably fewer of you even have substitutes, backup drivers. How many of you drive on a daily basis or, or route or whatever it takes to get the job done? So making sure that everybody has that information. So let's talk about employee conduct because um, like it or not, you're probably gonna have some type of um, involvement in conducting investigations and um, possibly imposing discipline. And what I wanna begin with is contact human resources when you first identify there may be an issue and you've, you've collected some documentation. And um, when you first perceive there's an issue, will depend on what the issue is. Some of you will be dealing, and, and most policies say deal, GDQD says handle it at the lowest level possible. So that's probably in your lap. But if you've done that documentation and you're getting ready to move forward with any type of action, contact human resources department. And of course, it depends on your district procedure. It depends on who is available to support you. And it also depends on the type of employee and the type of contract or working agreement your um, district uses. So let's go over um, just some of these. Discipline per GDQD, and that's assuming you all have the same policy, discipline can be imposed by the supervisor. The appeal is to the supervisor's supervisor. And you as a supervisor, you're supervising, and this is your policy, you can impose up to a suspension without pay for up to five days. But before you go down that path, make sure that you are in contact with HR and that you're doing it the way your district does it. I happen to work for, with districts that only the superintendent will, will be considered the supervisor or the supervisor's supervisor. But under um, the, um, and, and discipline could be anything from a, a written warning to a letter of reprimand to um, reprimand with directives or suspension without pay for up to five days, okay? And I, I could get way off in the weeds on all these procedures, but I'm gonna try to go over these with a high level and then kind of back down a little bit. Um, suspension of employees. If you wanna suspend somebody and send them off for more than five days, you may not do that without the help of at least a director of HR, something at that level. Superintendents, especially in the big, big districts, sign this off and, and put that on to other level leaders, knowing they're signing off on their own process. Um, just make sure you know who that person is in your district prior to needing it or to your school. Um, and maybe, it, and maybe it's you, the superintendent gives it to you. But superintendent for at-will employees, um, and I've heard oftentimes people say, well, they're at will, we can terminate them for a reason or for no reason at all. And their working agreement probably says that. But when you're talking about somebody's taking somebody's livelihood away, there is a low level of due process that's afforded to anybody. And that is some expectation that there's communication about what's going on. If it's a term employee, and we do have a lot of term employees probably in transportation that is for a limited term of time, it does require a higher level due process. And the appeal for a suspension goes to the governing board. Even if the superintendent issued the um, suspension, the appeal then goes to the governing board. So that makes it a little bit higher level. So you wanna make sure that you're doing that one right. And then dismissals, at will employees, even though we say we can, we can terminate them for cause or without cause, it's still the superintendent has to make that action. You can recommend to the superintendent that that action be taken and that's typically how it works. But the governing board as part of that process, that dismissal process, the person has the right to be heard by the governing board. The governing board does not have to grant that, but they can be heard by the governing board. The governing board does not take any action, but they can be heard. That gets ugly especially in small towns when people show up to governing boards and want to talk about why they were fired. So we want to make sure that we kind of protect ourselves from that. And then a uh, term employee, there, there is a hearing process that's used and HR can walk you through that process. Um, I like to talk about conducting investigations because your investigations begin at that 
first contact with the employee that I mentioned um, under attendance. And, and you may be contacting an employee about any small thing, document that first conversation with the follow-up email. Um, of course, follow your policies regarding drug and alcohol testing, and we know Human Resources will support you on that, but we also know that most of you do that in isolation of HR, especially in big districts, because you're required to by the Department of Transportation. But make sure that you document all of that. When you're um, thinking about, mm, is this something that I need to consider discipline for? Um, determine, take some time. Think about what information do you need before you start that investigation. Don't go blindly into a conversation. Sometimes you get pulled blindly into conversations. Somebody shows up in your office and says, let me tell you what so-and-so did. But before you respond, think about what information you would need to either, and I'll use these terms and they're far more um, formal and legal-ish than they need to be, but what information would you need to exonerate the person who's being accused or what information would you need to convict the person that's being accused? And obviously we don't convict anybody, but what, what information is needed? And then start asking who has that information? Who do you need to get information from? Who are the people? And is there any electronic evidence for this claim of misconduct by another person? Start gathering that early, okay? As, and I, I'm not the assume that all things are gonna go badly kind of person. But if you assume that all things are going badly and you have a process every time um, you think there might be discipline in the future, you will save yourself time trying to find it later. So do start thinking about what is that information needed? Who has it? How will I get that information? Then when you're conducting in the, um, investigations, that big pile of documents recommends, rec represents about how much documentation you'll need, even if it is electronic. It is always best to address it at the lowest level possible, but know that your policy does allow for progressive discipline. So if you address some um, and give somebody just a letter of warning for, let's use attendance as an issue for showing up late five times in the month you've given them just a verbal warning. The next time it needs to be written, the next time they might need um, directives, the next time they might get suspension without pay. So consider that progressive discipline process and make sure you're documenting so you know that they know what that next level is. It's afford the employee the opportunity to respond to allegations, even at the lowest level of due process. And again, sometimes things are just so egregious, you're gonna come in and say, your, your, your time here has ended. HR is gonna help you with that, but make sure they have an opportunity as a human to respond to whatever happened to them. And then make sure you document the contact with the employee as always. Um, I'm gonna go, I think there's one more slide that um, I wanna talk about. And I know human resources might be, not be the department, it may be another name for it, but we all know who we're talking about. Um, before you start conducting formal interviews, well, let, let me back up. Handling things at the lowest level possible means that you will be doing some interviewing of witnesses. You'll be interviewing people. You'll be wanting to ask questions. You'll be following up. You'll want to get some of that information. And I'm going to assume that as leaders of your department, your, your district, your school has afforded you the opportunity and the leeway and the autonomy to do that. I do still recommend that you contact human resources so that again, you are following district precedent, especially if you haven't been someplace for very long. If you're new to your role or new to your district, you may find out that there's a certain way we do things around there. The human resources department also might have some templates and some formal communication across that, that makes your job much easier in documenting and conducting those investigations. They also might be able to provide you with information about the employee's prior conduct that you didn't know about. And that might um, guide how you move further down this process. Okay, so even though you're the one responsible for conducting the, the um, interview, the investigation and imposing the discipline, your human resource team should be very valuable to you in helping you with that process.
Okay, I'm going to stop right there because I saw a couple of things popping up in chat and I think I only have a couple of more slides. So if they're relevant to this are questions. Did you die? Okay, good. Okay, so we're that was not anything I need. Okay. Um, so lessons learned about um, discipline in your area. I'm going to share one and then I'm going to invite you to share one. I did an investigation where, um, and, it, and it's happened multiple times, so I'll just make something up in general. Somebody comes and tells you that something happened that another person did, and they, um, and, and, it, and sometimes adults, I was a junior high principal for a long time, so sometimes um, that job was a little bit easier because you expect children to behave in the ways that sometimes adults do. And then you find out, somebody comes and tells you that somebody else did something that's a violation of policy. So you have to follow up on that. But what you find out is the person who came and told you actually did a more egregious violation of policy and they're trying to cover their own actions. So it becomes intertwined in this big unraveling of, of a mess. So don't assume everything you hear is gonna lead you down the path of discipline to the person that you thought you were gonna end up being the one who disciplined. So. Um, I'm going to stop talking for a minute. Is there anybody else who has any um, interesting um, scenarios or questions about um, employee discipline or, or that process? Nobody has a story to share? I'm glad. That means everybody <laughs> hires right. They got the sec they got the notice about hiring right. And so there are no employee issues. That's great. I mean, I think I could talk about just briefly a most recent um, investigation where someone was claiming that colleagues were, she was feeling targeted by colleagues and um, and maybe just, they were just everywhere she was and walking too close and parking too close and just making her feel uncomfortable. Um, the hard part for me as not a brand new leader was like, but what was it? You know, so I got, I was happy to have the support of HR just to navigate through that. Cause it wasn't, she stood by me and elbowed me. It wasn't, she stood by me and right. Called me a name. It was in my space, making me feel threatened just by their presence, but not their actions. So that one was a hard one for me. Yeah, that one was a hard one to unravel. Anybody yeah. else? Okay. I, I really, I'll just take, I think we're running out of time here, but I will just take um, just a second to say that I really thought somebody might um, have some conversation about um, Arizona's um, medical marijuana laws and how that impacts um, transportation department. I don't know if any of you have dealt with that. So far, we did have a case in Kyrene where we had to kind of, and it wasn't a it wasn't a bus driver, but it was somebody who did have access to our district vehicles and, and how we had to unravel and unpack that. And um, the testing is very muddy um, for how you can pinpoint when somebody was actually under the influence. So that might be when you're really counting on your prepaid legal or your, your lawyers to help you navigate those until we get more cases in Arizona to set the precedent for how we behave in the world of transportation with somebody with a medical and, marijuana. And, and that may be, it may be a moot point now, but it may be a moving target as we move forward. Yeah, I think bus drivers are fairly, uh, or at least transportation is fairly protected from the medical marijuana side because you know, they can't have that in piece to drive as far as the CDL is concerned. But we have seen some of the over-the-counter CBD stuff that is available um, that does not require a medical marijuana card. And we were impacted by that uh, this year. And so uh -huh. um, we were hoping to have that be a presentation um, as part of this virtual conference. But um, unfortunately, the people that were going to be able to provide it for us were uh, doing some other work and just didn't just timing conflict. So we're hoping to do something a little bit more in depth just because of that CBD. There's a lot of people that will say, well, it does CBD over the counter doesn't have THC, uh, but there's trace amounts. And if you use it enough, it can show up in a, in a drug test. Um, it depends on the quality of the CBD as well. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so and it's we, gonna take 
one lawsuit for somebody for um, wrongful termination for somebody who has a medical marijuana card and they challenge the testing because that's one thing I learned was that test is what we use and what the normal urgent care uses may not be the quality that we need to support our termination in the future. So I would just say that should be on your radar. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Sorry, Jason, didn't mean to interrupt you. No, 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 you. You're, no you're, you're fine. We're, these are all things that, you know, as they're hot topics that have come up and, excuse me, things that are, we're working on, these are, you know, some topics that we want to be able to address here in the near future. So. Yeah. Well, that is all I have. I think we're running out of time anyway. I see some chats going happy just, hour. Let me just yeah. throw one more question. So what about okay. testing for white fleet drivers? So I know that some districts require their white fleet maintenance drivers to do the drug screen and follow certain protocols and training and others do not. Do you have uh, any thoughts on that, Dr. Romandini? Um, most of your policies regarding the use of um, employee vehicle, uh, the use of school vehicles, and I can't, pull, I don't have it off the top of my head, does address that issue if there is ever an accident or the district would like to or suspects and we did we i've dealt with that multiple times somebody has a very minor and we suspect something then you can and, and districts can can um require drug testing um and you probably have a contract with somebody so white fleet drivers are not exempt because they don't have a cdl that just falls that may fall under a different policy in your in your school or your district. Would that also include people in safety sensitive functions? I know that we hear a lot from the trust that says any employee that's in a safe, safety sensitive function, including like bus monitors per se, they're, they're there for students, you know, but we don't drug test them. Is there, you know, any guidance that you could share to that? Yes, well, yeah, and, and the policy that allows for um, districts to re require drug testing is any employee. If any time there is a suspicion of um, somebody being under the influence on the job, the district is within its right to um, re require a drug test. And there's but not pre-employment. Not pre-employment. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Was that the, I'm sorry, yes. Mine was more around the existing employees, so uh, yep. more or less that reasonable suspicion, but yep. at the same time, why are they not included, I guess, as randoms, is that we, we have to random our drivers, at, at least our CDL driving staff, yep. um, you know, every quarter, so why wouldn't that safety, sen anybody in that safety sensitive function be included in that, regardless if they're a driver or not? Yeah, and I, I've probably done, I've done, I can't tell you how many terminations of staff members I've done, but I'm, I'm always surprised at how many terminations of teachers I've done for being under the influence in the classroom. Sure. You would think there, you know, it's not. And I appreciate the conversation that, um, is it Mr. Fleming said, HR will take the DPS revocation is no longer qualified for the position. Absolutely. That is a, that is a, 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 a a reasonable, that's a reason to suspend. And we do that, and just like a teacher certificate, if your certificate is invalid, you no longer work for the district. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. All right. You guys are awesome. I wish I was face-to-face -face with you, maybe next year. Yes, for sure. I don't know, if I'll, be, I don't know if I'll be considered an expert in anything next year, because now I have to be the superintendent. You know, it would, be a, it would be a very interesting look from a superintendent's perspective on how transportation and school business work so i would yeah. love to get a superintendent and a couple governing board members to show yeah. up like one i would love to get that to show up to our conference to see I, what I, we do. Oh, that'd be awesome yeah that'd we'll have awesome. you back for sure i'm not okay. sure you want governing <laughs> board members <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing oh, your expertise thank you for inviting me i appreciate it and i appreciate the platform this was wonderful so i hope it was of value to all of you and my best to you as you finish out today and have a great conference tomorrow thank you so much thank, you. Right. thank you thank you